There's a comedian that I love. His name is Jay Phillips. He's one of the good ones. And Jay Phillips said to me once, he said, damn, Tifa, you write like a dude. And I was like, thank you. And I was like, hey, wait a second. <laughs> What's that mean you write like a dude? Like writing like a guy is supposed to be the standard of greatness and excellence? No, I write funny is what I do. Not only is he a writer, but he's a director, he's a producer, he's also known in the business as a showrunner. Please help me welcome the incredible, wonderful, talented, exceptional writer, Danny Kalis. What is your writing process like? Like, let's say you have an idea and now you're gonna create a script. I operate out of the gift of desperation. <laughs> okay. It takes a certain amount of motivation combined with some strategic procrastination to finally get me to write something. So do you wait like two days before you have to turn it in, a day before you have to turn well, it in? Well, let's start with the fact that I'm, I'm much better when somebody's paying me to write it. Okay. Let's just start with that. You're more motivated. That. I'm very motivated okay. when that happens, okay. but it didn't start that way. Okay. You know, it was waking up in the middle of the night after having dropped out of law school and staring at a cottage cheese ceiling, having just had dinner with one of my friends who had started at some firm at 30000 a year, which was a lot back then, and thinking, oh my God, I've ruined my life. And then um, I just kept writing spec scripts, and I wrote a movie script that sucked. It really started, certainly for me, with writing about something that I knew, which was the great American where I had worked. And that's what I often tell, you know, new writers or young writers, writers you know, which is the obvious, write what you know, uh, or some version thereof. Right. Why should they not write about something they don't know? Because a lot of times you go, well, why can't I write about? You, you absolutely can. I, I, I don't mean to suggest that you can't. In fact, for many writers, that's, that's what it is. Usually some, somewhere there's a connection to who you are, what you are, something, even if it's fantastical and has no relationship to your life, there is, usually it comes out mm -hmm. in the writing. But that's something you can look at after the fact. And every writer is different as to what their process is. I do a lot of thinking. I, do, I, I would come up with my best ideas when I'm on a trip when I'm driving, when I'm showering, when I'm, I mean, anything Away other, from the other than sitting there at the computer. So how writing. do you capture it? When oh, I, I, I make notes, I okay. jot things down. Truth of the matter is I practice telling my story a lot. Oh, okay. well, I'm thinking of doing something like this and then I tell the story. And the more I work at it, the so more it starts. So you're pitching it before you've written it. I, I, by the time I sit down to write it, I can usually, it can take me four years to come up with something and okay. I can write it in four weeks. Okay. It's marinating. It, it, and, and, and you're working it. I mean, that's the other part is, is practicing your storytelling craft is trying it out on people. I mean, but every writer is different. I remember when I started on Silver Spoons, you know, I was very deliberate. I wrote very detailed outlines. And, and I was working with this guy, Jim Gagan, who ended up uh, being a lifelong friend as well as my co-writer on creating The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody and on deck. He was the co-creator. But we started together on Silver Spoons. I was wow. there the first year, he came in the second year, and we had these selectric typewriters. I remember, uh, right? them I remember well. the little ball, you yes, know, I do. And, and you would type, and, and it would be, you know, chikadoom, 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 <laughs> just furiously <laughs> popping off of that uh, uh, cylinder. And uh, Jim, I would describe as a pure writer. I mean, he just had to write. He gets up every day and he will write, and he will Jim write Brooks. jokes. No, no, this is Jim Gagan. Oh, okay. Jim Brooks. Uh, very quickly once said to me when I asked him about his writing when he was working on a movie I said what's a good day for you and he said two pages <laughs> that's, that's two good. pages yes if Jim Brooks can sit down and get himself two good pages in one day he felt wow. like he had a good writing day that was Jim wow okay uh, with Gagan, I mean, like I said, every day, and he would write jokes, he was a stand, I mean, but he was always working. So we would be given our assignments, sent back to our rooms to work. So we had a, a, an attaching door between our two offices. We shared the same floor with the Jeffersons, by the way, at that point. So I'm in my office, and I'm writing my script, and I'm sitting there going, you know, chick -a -doom, chick -a -doom, and it had those erase 
things. Yes. Remember, we could go back yes. like a line. Yes, yes, yes. Right? So I would go. A little strip. Little right? So I would go. Ding. And then I go. And I'm always releasing, you know, meanwhile, Jim's next door, and all I hear is and he never stopped. Not for an hour, not for two hours. Finally, after the umpteen tong with me, I just threw the door, but I said, Aren't you done with your goddamn script already? And Jim goes, Oh yeah, I finished it an hour ago. I'm working on my play. I hate you. I hate you. <laughs> and that was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. So every writer's process is different. I I look, if you get to fade out, in my book you're a writer. If you get to the end, now go back and rewrite. You know, what be, did you say? I said, now go back and rewrite. Say that one more time. Rewrite. Rewrite. Okay. So you come up with an idea, you mull it over, you share with a lot of people, you're, you're basically just storytelling, and now you are ready. Well, let's start with the, the assignment, because that's where it starts. And if you're not getting paid, or if someone's not giving you the assignment, then you got to give the assignment to yourself. Okay. So what's the assignment? All right, the assignment to get started is you need a spec script if it's TV. You know, if you're going to write a movie, then you need to write your movie. And uh, if you're writing a spec script, then you're writing for a show that's already on the air, right? So all the work has been done for you. The characters have been created, the conflict, the situation, the tone of the show, everything is there for you. But like I said, as a showrunner, I'm killing every week to get a new story. So if you can walk in with a story for me, you have made a sale. That's what I'm looking for when I got all those episodes to do. Because um, your writers will document I'll give it, it to whoever okay. did it. I mean, we're always going to rewrite. It's okay. always going to change. So in my case, I wanted to... Uh, uh, Dave Davis, after he read my pilot, said, you got to do a spec script. So I looked at Taxi and I said, all right, what's the story that I want to do? And I had a, a couple of ideas. The first thing you do is you look at the characters you want to write for. You got to go right down the middle of the series. All right. So uh, in the case of Taxi, uh, you know, it was all these losers, uh, except for one who wanted to be a cab driver. And I thought uh, I wanted to do a show about Louis, mm -hmm. Danny DeVito, and Mary Lou Henner. What was the primary conflict? between those two characters. Well, he was always hitting on her. The story I, idea I came up with is I said, well, what if, two very important words, what if Louie gets caught peeping at Elaine? She, she gets, gets him fire. fired. And that became the premise for my second one that I wrote. Uh, which was uh, Louis goes too far, and then he's got to beg for his job back after he gets fired, convincing her that he understood what uh, was wrong with peeping at a woman without her permission. Sexual harassment story. The second one I did was uh, one where, um, again, you start with character. Well, the hardest character to write a story for was the reasonable man character lead, Alex Rieger in Taxi. You know, he wanted to be a taxi driver, and I thought, well, I wanted to do a show about addiction in some way. So I thought, well, what if Alex was a compulsive gambler? Somebody gives him the biggest tip of his life, dropping him off at Atlantic City, and he goes in and he goes off the wagon and he starts gambling. And then I thought, well, the story for most addicts is takes another addict to save you. And the other favorite character that I had on that show, that I loved on that show, was Reverend Jim, who was a major drug yes. addict. And it's Reverend Jim saving Alex, the compulsive gambler, in a toilet when Alex is begging Jim for his last dime. The story, the beginning, the middle, the end, for, all, for both of these, uh, remained the same inciting incident which got him into trouble, peeping at a lane, or going off the wagon, a complication, which is he gets fired in the other episode, in the first episode, in the gambling episode, it's that he starts to uh, lose his money again and then has to be saved in the end. Those things are, are, are the things you have to do in writing your story. So the process is once you get yourself that inciting incident, once you kind of figure out where you may be going in the end, you're rewriting towards that the whole time including the stories that were actually told. I mean, I came up in my draft about these scripts with um, you know, penultimate scenes and stories and how they would unfold, but by the time the rewrites were done and the last show was shot, those stories had been rewritten three, four, five times 
trying to find just the right one. You know, my, my current writing partner these days came in as a young writer. She, she, it was at the end of Who's the Boss where I was killing for stories. She came in and she gave me her what if, which was what if Angela and Tony, who in a previous episode had checked into a hotel under the same name, and now the IRS says they're officially married, I went, oh my God, in the seventh year of a show, I'm killing for that story. That's a great story uh, for us to do. The most important part of the process is the what if. What's the story? What's that inciting incident? Or what's that last scene that you just want to go for? When we came up with uh, The Sweet Line, Jim Gagan and I were working on Silver Spoons. We were, uh, you know, well over 30 plus years ago. And we had just gotten rid of Jason Bateman, who went on to do his own series off that series. We had just gotten Alfonso Ribeiro, who had done the tap mm -hmm. dance kid in, on Broadway, and we said, this kid's a star. Let's see if we can come up with a show with him and get out from under these people who have got us working here at 2, 3 a.m. in the morning. What do we do? What's the what if? Well, the kid's talented, music would be good, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I had always said I wanted to do something like Eloise at the Plaza, but we couldn't get the rights to that. Jim went back east and had stayed in New York, uh, and he had just seen Bobby Short at the Carlisle. And he came back and he said, what if we did a show about a guy like Bobby Short, who has a kid, like Alfonso Ribeiro, and as part of their gig at the hotel they work at, they get a room. And that was the first Sweet Life. Um, we wrote it twice, sold it twice, but the third time was the charm when I went in and met to, with the Disney Channel. And now it were these twins that I was brought. So it starts with character. And I pitched them The Sweet Life, Only Mom is the Singer, with these two twins. And the line I used to sell it was, I said, uh, it's about two Bart Simpsons run amok at the Ritz. And in that premise, again, in that pitch, mm -hmm. everything was implied that had to be written. So when you talk about what's your process, well, if you got something that, that keys you into an active premise, and it starts with characters, two part Simpsons, run amok is your verb, at the Ritz, you know what you got. Once you've pitched it and they buy it, yes. you come out with your outline for... Right, after I did that, it was, okay, sold, go write it. For smart guy. Like I said, it's always easier when someone brings you a project. So if you don't have one, you've got to give yourself your own assignment. So that one was already created? The shows that are already created, you're trying to sell them a spectrum. Oh, okay. Original shows, oh, okay. you're coming up with, with everything. With an idea. Okay. You need your character. You need your, you know. So, uh, and then the situation, and then what the inherent conflict is week in and week out. So with Smart Guy, they brought me the kid. So I had a real kid. I, I, I asked Suzanne to pass, who was the... Right. The person who brought the kid to me, uh, and she was brilliant. I mean, found the Jackson Five. My goodness, mm -hmm. she knew talent. I said, "Tell me, in, in, you know, how would you describe Taj? You knew him. You know him because TV tends to be much more of a personality medium. You know, especially with kids, you're not going to get, mm -hmm. you know, the acting where they assume a whole other persona and person role. Uh, so uh, he said, she said, he's like a little man. He's really smart." So now I go home and I start thinking about, okay, he's a smart kid, and then you start, I started to, 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 to uh, free associate. Well, in my life, and again, you go back to sort of what you know, even if it isn't exactly your right. life, you're looking for that. Because the truth about writing is if you write something good, it's going to be universal and it's going to speak to anybody, even if they did not have that experience, it will somehow seem mm -hmm. real to them. I, I had a brilliant younger brother who, when he was you know, eight years old, went scavenging for parts down the alley and built himself a laser and for a science project, demonstrated it in class and burnt the teacher's desk. <laughs> Smart guy. Right. I went to high school with a kid, Cammie Monash, who was this little genius kid, you know, in, in my calculus class, and he was 11 years old. So I thought, okay, smart guy. I'll do a smart guy show about a genius kid, um in a blue-collar family, basically. And the way I pitched it was, I went in and I said, uh, I, I, like I said, I'm very visual, so I pitched the opening scene. You know, a yellow bus pulls up in front of a high school, you go close to the, the door, it, it mm -hmm. swings open, and you see a high school kid get out, another tall high school kid get out, another tall high school kid, and then at the bottom of the frame, you just see the top of the kid's head. <laughs> and then behind him, another tall high school kid, and then 
as you widen out, a, a cute little cheerleader comes out and says, did you get on the wrong bus, little boy? He goes, nope, I go to school here. See you at the prom, and walks off. Now he goes in to his class, he sits down at a desk in front of a girl who's being hit on by this cute guy, and as he sits down at the desk, the guy leans over and he says, scram, he gives him a look, and he walks away, and the girl goes, well, why were you so mean to that cute little boy? And he goes, that's no cute little boy, that's my brother. <laughs> At that, which point Garth Anseer said, I like this show, it's a buy. You know, so what the process is, you need that what if. It can come from anywhere. I, I became friends with this guy, Matt Williams, who had created Home Improvement. Mm -hmm. And he wanted me to work on the show, but I wasn't able to. I was doing another one. I call him up and I said, Matt, I have an idea for a show for, for Tim and for Home Improvement. And he said, what is it? I said, I'm just going to give you the title and you'll know what it is. He says, okay, what is it? And I said, to kill a woodpecker. And he said, thank you very much, <laughs> hung up the phone, and a month later they had a show on about the character going to war with a woodpecker that was driving him nuts, mm -hmm. which was the perfect Tim Allen right. show. It starts with his character. Mm -hmm. Man versus nature, man versus man, that was all home improvement was, but in a comedy. Right. You're bouncing off and free associating with whatever your challenge is mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when you're writing. Mm -hmm. In creating a show like The Smart Guy, which you got the actor, you were told, you're gonna, you're, we're writing for this kid. Right. So then you came up with the, with the pitch. Do you do a Bible, like of stories, for your first season? How, how does that work? Usually, you, you know, you, you, you pitch them the show, they buy the premise, then they want to know you know, anywhere from five to ten stories. They sometimes ask for Bibles. The big difference was that when you're doing episodic TV, which is what we used to do all the time, you didn't need a Bible, per se. Because if you had a good show, you knew the good show was going to give you stories. Okay. It, it had legs. You could tell that it had legs. You still had to give them an idea of what the type of stories were. Uh, these days, they do serialized which is the whole binge watching right. thing where you know it's like we all lose our friends and which families. Which was started by House of Cards, thank you very much. Uh, back in 2008, 2000, 2008, I went to NAPTI. Ted Sarandos, who mm -hmm. is Netflix, was giving a speech about what they were doing at Netflix and they were just starting into originals. And as I sat there listening, he said, we just bought The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. And I'm going, oh. You can't get a better entree for me than this. So after his talk, I went up and I said, I'm Danny Kalis, co-creator of The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. Would you be interested in buying another series from me? Because I'm down here trying to independently market my own shows. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, the answer is no, because we're more interested in shows that people watch over and over again from beginning to end. We want them to come to Netflix and then watch it. They weren't even calling it binge watching yet. And I said, but why would you get The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody then? He said, because if it's an established show, what we've discovered is kids will watch it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And that works for our business model. So we wouldn't buy an original, but of course we'd buy one that was already right. established. So the way we view TV has changed so radically. And now instead of doing 22 episodes in a season, we're looking at doing anywhere from 6 to 10. Doesn't mean stories are any right. less important, right. but the model has so significantly changed in that way. Back then, before House of Cards, they were figuring out that streaming, well, it wasn't even streaming then, it was downloading, it was sending out... Right, the videos. The videos, that that was a business model. I mean, in, in the mm -hmm. days when my uncle first started in TV, that golden age of television, you saw the episode once when it was on, and then summer reruns. I mean... That's it, yeah. That was it. You having been a veteran in this business for so many years and knowing the ins and outs of writing back in the day to what it's evolved to today, that you have a business in which you can mentor young writers or help, help get them on the right track. 
there's so many people out there teaching classes on how to, you know, how to sell your show, how to pitch your show, how to, but they've never sold a show. They've never pitched a show. They've never written a show. And yet they've become the script doctors. And so what I appreciate is the fact that you've done it all. In addition to what you do, mm -hmm. your day job, which is running shows, you also have a business where you help young, young writers or writers who got stuck, I would think. If I was writing and I got stuck, I would want to go to somebody to kind of help me get out of the ditch. I had great mentors, great teachers, and so paying back is very much a part of, uh, it's who I am now more than ever. I was given this great opportunity to go teach down at Chapman. I thought my career was pretty much over. <laughs> I was about 50 at the time. I had just shot this pilot for Sweet Life and didn't know if it was going to get a pickup uh, and had the best time of my life marshalling these 60 kids uh, down at Chapman to actually produce, shoot this pilot they had written in a previous class that a friend of mine had written. He said, you're the only writer, producer, who's also director that I know and you want to teach. And I said, I'll take the class. It was just fantastic, you know. And, and they, even, they, they even gave me a plaque. In the Friendship Hotel, uh, on this day, May 17, 2004, we present Professor Danny Kalis the first annual Kami Award for Best Professional in a Student Sitcom Production. <laughs> and they gave me the top ten Dannyisms. Ten. Comedy is precision. Nine. That is horrible. Off the student's <laughs> tears. But it's, it's pretty good. We can work with it. Hey, what about a RuPaul type? Can we get a RuPaul type? I really want a RuPaul type. Number seven, quiet. Wait, speak up. Number six, hold. Number five, did I ever tell you all about the time? Yeah, I did a lot of that. Oh, that's I hilarious. That. Four, you have 17 hours to restructure Act 2. Is that going to be a problem? <laughs> Three, I yell at you for everyone's benefit. <laughs> Two, hold. <laughs> uh, one, track the attitudes, people. So. Nice. Uh, when you're on a big sound stage and you got 100 people, you know, you're, it's, it's, it's an army. Teaching these kids was great and teaching them in a way where I said, I'm going to run this just the way I would run a show. No different. They loved it. At least a handful of them ended up working in the business. And after that, uh, once Sweet Life had its run, I went back and started teaching at UCLA. And now I'm developing a website uh, and a service in which uh, I can reach more uh, students who really do have something uh, to offer and are looking to produce uh, scripts, not simply uh, experiment. The best group I had coming through UCLA started with me in, in how to outline your spec script, the whole process, and actually deconstruct a script for a show already on the air and then construct And that's own. important before you start writing because you need to know what that process is. The best thing to do, I didn't have the, the classes, the schools, but I had a girlfriend at the time who was the secretary to Tony Thomopoulos who was running ABC. Mm -hmm. And he got all the scripts from all the sitcoms for ABC, but he wouldn't read them. So she would send me all the scripts. So all I did was read script after script after script after script. You start to absorb what it is. You begin to hear the rhythms. You begin to see how the, the, the story rises and falls and rises again. So when you talk about today, and you just got to write. You got to put it down on paper. Right, but what you've done is you've boiled down all the experience you have and say, okay, I'm going to give you a cheat sheet. This is what the spine of, uh, of the story is. We're going to start with the skeleton, and then we're going to add to it. At UCLA, you taught, um, your first class was on outlining the, the story. UCLA has a great setup. The first thing they do, and this is for half hour, hour, and I'm sure they have it for screenplay. In the half hour world, they start with a class on outlining your spec script. And in that, you start with the story that you come up with. And you learn how to uh, develop a story and write the outline. From which, in the second class, you actually write the full script. And that's where you will learn how 
to write your dialogue, um, how to um, you know attack a scene, where to come in, where to go out, and of course the rewrite because you're always rewriting throughout that. The third class follows uh, a similar one, only now you're doing the pilot. You're, okay. You're writing an original premise for a pilot. You've learned how to write a script, so Correct. now we want to see what you can do as on an your original. Own. Okay. Uh, where before all the elements were there, the character, the uh, conflict, the tone, the, the, the who, what, where, why, and how of it is there, we still needed the story. Now you need everything when you do your own. And that's more difficult and requires something of a different skill set um, as well. And you do first the outline on that, then you do writing the script. Uh, and there was uh, one group in particular which ended up being a core group of eight students over the course of one year who stuck with me through the whole thing. And I would say there's at least, at least five, six of them that I would have put on staff as beginning writers on a show because they had learned how to write. And they had proven um, their ability to deliver. And that's key. So from a point of view of, 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 of what, do, what do I tell writers about how to structure a story. Uh, I remember the first speech writing um, coach I ever had when I was a, a freshman in high school. He said, the first thing is the whole hum part. Oh, what, what's the whole hum part? The whole hum part is, you better grab my attention or I'm walking out of here. Mm -hmm. Why should I listen? And that's your opening. That's your inciting incident. Why should I watch this show? You need a solid opening to draw you in. Mm -hmm. The best book I ever read that gave me a sense of, of how to do the act of premise uh, and to deliver on a beginning, middle, end was a book called The Art of Dramatic Writing. Yes. La Jose Agri wrote a terrific book. Yes. Starts with character, of course, all the time. But in it, he discusses uh, the Hegelian theory of the dialectic. It's thesis, antithesis, and synthesis otherwise known as your beginning, middle, and end. There we go, back to the beginning, middle, and end. And in that thesis, you set up what the character's conflict or journey is. Now, mm -hmm. there are plenty of places online where you can go find the hero's journey, right? and you can get it broken down, not just into beginning, middle, and end, but you can have eight parts of the journey, and the rising conflict and tension, uh, all of the elements that help you fill out that story and um, give you your scenes. If you start with a premise, a thesis, something that is challenging to your lead character, and then you give them an obstacle, something that, that, that's going to make it more difficult to achieve, that want, that end. If you don't have a character that wants something, you've got nothing to listen to. I'm, I'm whole humming my way to the next channel. Once you've reached that, then you've got to get to that synthesis, that great last scene. Think about all the great last scenes that you've seen. That um, may not have ever been there when you first started out, but somehow over the process of discovering your character, the mm -hmm. journey, and where that took you, you get this incredible last scene. That's your synthesis that brings it all together at the end. That rising conflict is, is, is everything, and the best way to learn it is take your favorite TV shows, take your favorite movies, and deconstruct them. And in deconstructing it, one of the things you want to look for is what's a real story beat. Most people don't know what a real story beat looks like. In one of my classes, this, this, uh, this woman was writing an Insecure. And I said, go deconstruct the pilot of Insecure. And so she came back in. I said, okay, tell me the first scene. What was the first story beat? Well, she's in front of her computer, not a story beat. Uh, and sh it's her birthday, okay, it's her birthday, not a story beat though. Uh, and behind her is her boyfriend asleep in bed, okay, still not a story beat. And she's online and she gets a text from her ex-boyfriend who wants to see her. And she went, oh, that's the story beat. I said, correct. Girl on her birthday gets a text from an ex-boyfriend ex while her current boyfriend is asleep in bed behind her. That's a story beat. Right. Everything else is not. It's important. It's going to be used in the play, mm -hmm. but it's not a story beat.
deconstruct episodes, deconstruct movies, really challenge yourself and say, what's the story beat? What's moving the story forward? And the minute you hit something that isn't moving your story forward, it's going to be on the cutting room floor. The lie is that those that can't do teach. So it's always great when you have people who do teach. When you mentor a young writer, do you hold that, that writer accountable to get so many pages done um, within a week or a month or to bring you back a whole script? Is it just you're walking them through process in a general way or do you get specific with them? Do you give them notes on the script? Right, two different questions. The deadlines are the deadlines. You know, I, I, I used to call them drop dead dates. Uh, like I would say to my line producer, uh, when do I have to give you a decision on this? And he'd say, uh, Friday. I said, no, 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 no. I want to know my drop dead date next Tuesday. Okay, thank you. That means no matter what, if I don't have that decision, I'm screwed. Okay. Same for a writer. Now, I don't care if you write it the hour before. I don't care if you write it the day I gave you the assignment and you went home. All I care about is the drop dead date. Is my drop dead okay. date. Does it come in? And when you're not working a show and when you're not on assignment, it's really hard to give yourself drop dead dates. That's, Unless you're getting a paycheck. Boy, that makes it easy. Okay. So you got to pretend, you got to fool yourself. So from the second, I think, was what sort of notes do I give? If I'm teaching a class, then part of the note is to, to, to provide also um, a, a, a more of a, a, a lesson uh, as to how this relates to writing and the process and all. But if we're just working, I'm not teaching. Okay. We're just trying to solve a problem. I'm, okay. You, we're equal. What I would tell writers in a room is that uh, you can disagree with me once, you can disagree with me twice, you can disagree with me 13 times. But the minute I say this is the way we're going with a story, I expect you all to be rowing in the same direction at that point. But in the process, you know, I don't care where that joke comes from or where that story turn comes from, as long as it works mm -hmm. and makes it better. So in giving notes, that's the, the approach I take, which is, okay, how do we make this better? Why isn't this working? Here's where I stub my toe uh, on your story, where I stop being interested. You lost me here. It's really that simple. When I give somebody a script to read, I don't necessarily, you know, what I'm really looking for is where, when did it stop working for you? Okay. When did I lose you? The Ten Commandments of, of writing, I kind of think, boils down to thou shalt not bore. Keep us entertained. Engage We're, us. It's that as the filmmaker, it's that as the director, you know, the director's job is to keep it moving so that it flows, the writing should flow, the acting should flow. When you got, when you're clicking, it's all value added. Everybody brings something to it and the next thing you know, you got a hit. So everybody go do a hit. Excellent. Guess what? I've got this fabulous little bundle just for you because you are a fabulous actor. I got it for you. So what do I got for you? Let me tell you what I got for you. I got the PR cheat sheet, which every actor needs. You need to know how to do your own PR until you get that job where you can pay for a PR person. Then I have the 12 step audition. That's another cheat sheet. You know, sometimes you get freaked out at auditions and you don't know what to do. Well, my 12 step audition cheat sheet will help you and guarantee that you will slam your audition every time. And the third thing I got for you is the casting sites. I have a list of casting sites so you can go and just submit yourself for that next big part. How does that sound? It sounds good, doesn't it? What advice would you give to somebody who wants to start doing stand-up? Stay in school. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you're funny and you think you can do it, Try it. You know, it's a lot of fun. Look, it's a good gig. The business is a little tricky because at the end of the thing, you don't get a gold watch. You know, you don't get a pension. Do this. Be passionate about it. Save your money. Work as much as you can. Get up as much as you can. The more you get up, the better you become. If you do it like once a month and go, well, I think it's I'll not do gonna it. Work. In, I think I'll do it in July again. You know, and then yeah. you wonder, how come they're not laughing? Well, you know. Yeah, because it's a muscle. Absolutely. You gotta, you gotta work that muscle every day. Yeah, 
you have a chance and opportunity to get up, go ahead and do it. What is uh, one of the misconceptions you see when uh, people sign up to take your classes? A lot of times what I'll see is somebody who's funny in the street, which is a good thing because some guys are naturally funny. You want to be naturally funny to be a comedian, but they want to bring that to the stage. And it's a different animal when you get on the stage because you're not talking to your boys in, in the, on the corner. You, you're talking to an audience. It might be a diverse audience. It might be, you know, whatever. But these people came to be, get entertained. You know, it's not like when you're in the street, you go, hey, you, your mama this, and, you know, and you're a little offensive and stuff. So I tell them, there's a technique. This is how you do a joke. There's a formula. There's the premise to set up the punchline. Not everything is a cuss word, you know, because when you do it in the streets, you can be funny just cussing away. And now you gotta, you got to develop a set, and then you got to have stage mechanics. You have to have a personality. You have to be likable. You have to have your own voice. So they're like, well, you got to do all that. And go, That's part of it, man, you know. There's guys that go up there and try to do what they do in the street or at home, and it doesn't translate on stage. Or by the water cooler. Yeah, <laughs> by the water cooler, exactly. Yeah, it doesn't translate on stage. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing you to one of my comedy mentors and heroes, one of the best comics in the world, Jackson Purdue, what is your advice to some young person out there who wants to start doing stand-up but has no clue? Well, you know what? It took me a long time to realize this. It's not about the jokes. You know, people labor on the jokes and the material. It's not, the, you've got to have good material, no question about it. But it's more about, it's not what you say so much. The audience doesn't go by what you say. It's how you make them feel. You know who's getting all the parts in TV and stuff? All these alternative comics like Janine Garofalo and, you know, all the people who bomb in a straight comedy club, the people doing set-up punchline. So it's not the joke so much, but you got to really work on your personality, your, your, your humanity. That's what you're trying to, you know, your own brand of craziness people want to tune in. And they don't have to have anything in common with you. Like, you know, Richard Pryor did that. He got to his truth. People identified with it because I identified with the truth. They didn't have to live in the ghetto, you know. A lot of suburban white people love Richard Pryor because they knew, hey, this crazy motherfucker is telling his truth, you know. So, so it's about telling your truth, expressing yourself, being you, getting your essence out there. Because it's not the jokes. After the show, people come up to you, man, I like that joke that you did. And you didn't even do the joke. The other guy did. So they don't remember what you said. They remember how you made them feel. You know, read, study, you know, talk to some people, work on, get deep, you know, get, get, you know, that's what you want to bring up there. That's what you're selling up there is you, your ideas, your thoughts. The more you got to, you know, the deeper your well, the more you have to draw from, right? I mean, you know, I love that's this. That's for any artist. That's for any artist and just love itself. Uh, you know, I love this saying that one can only love as deep as they are. You know, can a shallow person love deeply? I don't know. You know, I don't think so. You can only... So you only have, you can only give what you have, right? You can't give what you don't have. So if you have no depth, no ideas, no thoughts, no character, you, you can't give that to anybody across the footlights, right? Right. You know, uh, so, you know, work on yourself. Get good with yourself, you know? So that, that's it. Not, not the jokes. It's not the jokes. It's you. You know, smiling is a big thing. Looking like you're having fun is a big thing. Having fun. Having fun. It's so corny, but I always say, you know, fun is the first word in funny. So, you know, you gotta have, because people came there to have fun, you know? But you gotta have, you gotta express your truth. That's first and foremost, because sometimes your truth might not be fun. You would just might be a crazy motherfucker like Sam Kennison. But people enjoy that. Look at that dude go off, man. That's fucking entertaining. That is entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but if that's true, don't fake right. it, you know, but if that's your, you know, a lot of people, their whole comedy thing is angst. Well, go with it, you know, be an anxious motherfucker, you know, mm -hmm. but go all the way with who, you, if that's you, do you, you know, that ain't going to work for me because I ain't anxious. Who were the um, comedians at the store that really impacted you? The people that I watched, uh, you know, and I, and, and I watched every night because I was living with my mother and her husband at the time in a very small place. So I had to get out every night. So I'd go to the comedy store every single night just to get out of the house. And you have to watch it all. I'd watch, I learned more from the people who are making mistakes, who are bombing, than I did from guys who were killing. 
I learned what not to do. Like, hey, that don't work. You know, they don't get mad at the crowd and say they suck. That don't work. Let's talk about that for a second because that seems to be the the standard now with a lot of comics. It's like they come out, they don't have a set, they're not prepared, but they immediately go to attack the audience. Because they're inexperienced and they've got nothing and they get scared of it. It's, it is going up there naked, you know. If you, you don't have anything. Well, that's what that's what happens. Fear comes in, and you're going to go into that attack mode. My other favorite um, Jackson Purdue line is the acronym of fear. Oh, fuck everything and run. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, again, there's only love and fear, right? So my thing now in development is I'm just trying to connect. I'm just trying to look people in the eye and really connect and not talk at them. You know, and, and, and not just throw the material out there. But again, you've got to have good material because sometimes the crowd ain't playing that, okay? And they just, <laughs> and you've you got to have the jokes. You've got to have the jokes. You know, because you could bring your own stream of consciousness alternative thing up there and they ain't hearing it. They just ain't even from your world. But jokes are jokes. This is a setup, this is a punchline, and people get the jokes. They might even not like you, but go, that guy was funny, but not my style. But hey, he was funny. He wasn't just up there blabbing about his, you know, his bullshit, you know, that ain't got nothing to do with me. Being a service, that's, that's what I love a yeah. uh, quote from Snoop Dogg. He said, uh, don't be nervous, be of service. <laughs> I said, okay, yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Because it is a service, you know, you are uh, servicing, you are contributing to humanity by making people laugh. And I always say, the beautiful thing about stand-up comedy is that it's such a sublime alchemy to take one's personal pain and transform that into public pleasure. I mean, there's nothing more sublime than that, right? You know? She is an award-winning TV writer, best-selling author, film, television, and live event producer, director, visual artist, inspirational speaker, stand-up comedian, mother and grandmother, and child of God. Please help me welcome T. Faye Griffin. Welcome! When did you decide you wanted to be a, a writer in the business? I'm a, I think I'm an accidental uh, everything. And, and what I mean by that is with the stand-up, I hosted a Christmas program with Walter Tucker, who at the time, right before he became mayor of Compton, we went to the same church. Shout out to Bread of Life and Carson. Shout out to Oasis. Hey, how you doing? I shout out people. Cause there's right so many it. people That's that are right. a part of the foundation of who I am. So I always want to pay homage. But anyway, so we hosted this little Christmas program at the church. And Walter said to me, he goes, my gosh, you're very funny. Have you ever thought about doing stand-up? And I was like, no, but like David Allen Greer would say, but I think I can now, like to see it, here it go. And that's how it started. <laughs> it was not a con it was not ever a conscious thought that I should do stand up. Someone suggested it and I did it. And Living Color became the same way. My first writing gig in the business was the same way. I was writing, as you said, I was writing sketches for the children's church at the Oasis. So for yeah, quite a few years. I mean, you were doing it for a little while. I was there for a while, and yeah. I was also writing with the in-house theater company headed up by Penny Johnson Gerald, the Oasis Theater Company. I was a writer in residence and an actress there. Sonia Rice, Elshonia Rice, or Elshonia Smith as she is now, uh, was heading up the children's plays. And she said, have you ever heard of a show called In Living Color? And go, oh my gosh, this you know, was the hottest thing going at that time. It was into its third season by then. And I go, that's my favorite show. And she explained that she had met with them and pitched them a couple of seasons in a the row. They had never booked her, but her agent said, um, maybe if you go in with a partner. And so she said, do you think you'd be interested in writing on The Living Color? I'm like, sure. And again, accidental. It wasn't intentional. I was very, I was quite content writing, you know, plays and skits and illustrated sermons for Pastor Philip and getting rejected by every publisher because I thought I was going to be a children's book author. That's the thing I just should mm. say. And so I have all these rejection slips from probably every major publisher in the world. They weren't buying stories of that at so uh, what was African American kids? What was that experience? You your first job in the business, yes. Mm -hmm. You book in Living Color. Well, well, I shouldn't say your first job because you I were came doing out of stand up. Well, I was at PBS. My day job, okay, because you know stand up was not 
feeding me. So right. I was actually working at KCET. I was a welfare mother. You said I was a single mom, right. a divorced mom. Absolutely. Got a job in the member services department at KCT, which is the PBS station mm-hmm. here in L.A. And worked my, I was there almost seven years, working my way up the food chain. I became a secretary. I became a coordinator. And I was on track to be a manager. And I actually turned down a management job because um, I felt there was somebody who was better qualified me, than me. And everybody thought I was crazy. It's like, you know, why would you give up this opportunity? You've worked hard. You know, they're going to give it to you on a golden platter. But something in me said no. And within two weeks of saying no, Sonia came to me and said, have you ever heard of a show called A Living Color? So I left. KCET, which is technically my my foray into entertainment, mm-hmm. and went into the Fox Diversity Writing Program with Sonia, and life oh, changing. so you did that first before in Living Color? No, that was in Living Color. We were assigned to in Living Color. Oh, okay. Through the Fox, and they had, so tell us about the the twentieth century uh, writers program. I wasn't familiar at, with it at all. I didn't know anything like that it, it even existed, and that's. I think it was a budgetary thing because we did not apply for the program. So they Felicity Hoffman, you. they probably did. They did a little Felicity Hoffman and got us in the program in the back mm-hmm. door. So um, they would have to pay you. So regular, they would have to pay us uh, the regular fee staff, for writing, yeah, yes. writers, uh, writers Guild rate. And so what happened was they had thirteen weeks with us as trainees, and then after that thirteen weeks, they could say yes, we want to staff them, or no, we don't. We were there two and a half weeks. Keenan said, staff them. I want them. They're, they're amazing. Staff them. So we didn't even finish the program. We became staff writers like our third week there, mm. which was amazing. To your, to your question, you know, how was that process and how, how did it impact me? I became hell on wheels. My head got this big. I was so egomaniacal. It was not even, I was writing on a hit show, you know, the hit show. And I had no real Hollywood experience. PBS was not. Hollywood. I went from wearing pantyhose to work every day to coming to work in jeans and had a corner office, you know, not a corner office, but a big office. And I was a mess. I just, Pastor Philip asked me to write a sketch um, during that period. And I told him flat out, I don't write for free anymore. And I was deadly serious. So yeah, I was a mess. I was a mess. <laughs> Don't hit it, Lord. Don't hit it. Lord, I was dropping names. The tide turned when my mother had a backyard picnic and did not invite me and my kids. And I and I found out about it, and I was so hurt. And I was like, why Why didn't we get it? She said, because no one wanted to hear you drop names. Because I was a name dropping so-and-so. And I'll tell you, I was talking to Keenan, you know. <laughs> and David Allegra walked in. And so I said, have you seen Jim Carrey? You know, I was like that. And everybody was like, you know. And they had had enough of me. So, yeah, I was a mess when I first started. I didn't know any better. So that first year on In Living Color, what did you learn? I'm assuming there was so much that you gleaned from, um, first of all, being one of the few women, because I'm assuming it was just you and Sonia that were... There were three of... Uh, well, four if you count, count Pam Vise, who was a head writer at the time. So there's Pam Vise, there was Nancy Newfeld. Um, and then there was Sonia and I. We were the only women um, that first season that we were there. Um, I think Nancy was there when we got there. But we were, we, were, we were the girls. We were the girl writers. Okay. And so the very first thing that I learned is that there is no respect for girl writers. One of my heroes is Madeline Pugh Davis, who was the co-writer of all of I Love Lucy's shows and everything that Miss Ball did. She was, and her biography, is her autobiography is called... Madeline, Madeline Davis, girl writer. And a lot of the challenges that she had, we experienced as well. The sexism was off the charts. We were regularly, I don't want to use the language, but we had a nickname by a particular head writer who I will not name, <coughs> Les Firestein. He called us the cunts. Mm. Hey, cunts, come on in. We're going in. We're going to the writer's room. You know, what are you cunts doing? That was our nickname. And I was so naive and so young in the business, I did not realize that was unacceptable. I thought that was, you know. Normal. Normal. Yeah. Because okay. as a woman, you don't want to make waves. You just, you just keep write, your head down and out. Work. I mean, I had given up. Let me tell you what I gave up at KCT. I was tenured there, if you will. I had a pension fund. I had a retirement plan. Uh, I had full health benefits. And I got could and they loved me there. I could have stayed there. I had a fellowship to WGBH in Boston. They sent me to 
do this fellowship and marketing. I mean, they were team TFAG, and I could have stayed there. I could probably still be there today. So it was a big risk for me to take to leave that job and go into a training program that might last 13 weeks. Mm -hmm. So when these things would happen, you know, as you said, I didn't want to, to rock the boat initially, but eventually I, I rocked the boat really hard. So you weren't treated like a regular writer because you were a girl. Because we were girls. So you wrote girl sketches, is that what? No, we, you know, we we fought and we wrote, we wrote, we pitched what we do. We pitched what we were, what we thought were funny. They tried to say, well, you write, you guys write for Allie and Kelly and, you know, all and, and Takia, you, um, uh, you guys write for them. I'm like, no, 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 we got stuff. We were instrumental in helping craft Ace and Main Man, which is two characters, franchisable characters that Jamie and, and um, Tommy Davidson did. You know, they, they were the kind of homeboys that were working as security or, you know, whatever. And Tommy, actually, his character was kind of like, you know, twitchy. <laughs> and so Sonia and I were helpful in helping craft those, you know, so we had the chops. There's a comedian that I love. His name is Jay Phillips. He's one of the good ones. And... Jay Phillips said to me once, he said, damn, Tifa, you write like a dude. And I was like, thank you. And I was like, hey, wait a second. <laughs> What's that mean you write like a dude? Like writing like a guy is supposed to be the standard of greatness and excellence? No, I write funny is what I do. That was the challenge is being the girl writers. Um, also, my Christianity, uh, my flat out living for the Lord uh, became a issue for certain people so I got the the reputation of being the church lady on top of it all what is something that you learned in the collaborating process or was it a collaborating process in that writer's room we pitched a lot of material here's the process you as a single writer as a team you would pitch anywhere from 10 to 50 ideas a day sometimes we were having three pitch sessions a day because we were just eating through material. And Fox's censorship standards were so much tighter and restrictive back then, so we couldn't do a lot of things we wanted to do that were very funny. But anyway, so you pitch the ideas. The, the head writers would go, and they would pick the, the ideas, and Keenan, whatever, they would pick the ideas that they wanted to see drafts. They'd come back and go, all right, we want you to do Jesus and Butthead, even though it was pitched by somebody else. You know, you get on that. Um, that thing you pitch, do that. This pitch that he pitched, I'd rather you do that. So it was very much them kind of strategizing strengths. Mm -hmm. Like they knew that, that Sonia and I had a very, you know, we loved doing the music videos. We had a very strong um, grip on doing the music parodies. And so we often got assigned to those. Now, once you do the draft, they may come back and go, okay, that's good, but we're going to have so-and-so do the rewrite on it. Or so and so to punch it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so it was very collaborative. I, I'm going to be very, very frank. There were times that Sonia and I, our bacon got saved by some of the, the guys that came in and, and took some of the stuff that we did they felt was too soft and punched it up and, and made it a little harder. So, yeah. You worked on In the Living Color, and then you went to Parenthood after no, that. No, I went back to Welfare. Oh, okay. Let's I went talk back about to welfare. That. You know, I have okay. three kids, not you two. Have three. I have a daughter three children, and two sons. And a daughter and two sons. And shout out to Brandy, BJ, John. You know, I had to shout my peoples out. After Living in Color, Sonia and I went out on a couple of meetings, and she had a different direction she wanted to go in. I just wanted to be home. And Living in Color was like 14 hour days, 12 hour days, 14 hour days. I'm raising two black boys in South Central Los Angeles in the 90s. I need to be at home. Mm -hmm. I need to be with my kids. So I made a decision to try to do drama uh, because episodic because it was a less strenuous work schedule mm -hmm. I could do, you know. And so we decided amicably to go our, our separate directions and she's still a friend to this day. And those jobs didn't come. I got sent out on stuff. I remember one particularly painful meeting where it was very clear that this man wasn't gonna hire me because I was black. It was for Lonesome Dove. Uh, if my spec script was good enough to get me in the room, and then I walk in and you go, oh my gosh, my agent. I told my agent, I said, you need to start telling people I'm black. Because <laughs> it kept happening. I would come in and they go, oh, okay, we didn't know. Uh, one um, 
development guy told me, he goes, well, I have to tell you, we, we, we have reached our quota on minority writers. What do you mean you reached your quota on? But anyway, be that as it may, I couldn't get, I couldn't get arrested after a living color. You would think I could not get arrested. So I went back on welfare. I went on welfare. I was getting food stamps and um, working jobs under the table. I did phone sex. Yes, I did. I did phone sex. I worked for a life insurance company uh, processing death claims. I I did all kinds of stuff. And then one day, Sonia calls me. And at that time, she was on the parenthood, and I'm getting ready to cry because I cry every time I tell this story. And she says, what are you doing right now? I go, right now, I got laid off from the insurance company. The call came the day I got laid off. And I was in Baldwin Hills, Crenshaw Shopping Plaza, just walking around with the kids. And I said, I'm just in the mall walking around. She goes, I got you an outside script. On shows, they will get a, they have a certain number of scripts that they would give to writers that were freelance or independent contractor writers. And I got a script. And I came in and I met with Loretha Jones. And I met with Robert. And I wrote the script. He says, if we come back next season, you'll be here at the table. And they came back the next season, and I was a staff writer on, on The Parenthood, and it just totally turned my, my career around. It was like my second, it was like my second chance. Uh, I'm fair, every time I see Robert, I you know, hug him up and just thank him for giving. For, so it's, I, it's kind of a divine coincidence, if you will, that my first break, my big break was Keenan. My second chance was Robert. Hmm. You know what I mean? I think that was some divine providence. You had your first opportunity and then your second opportunity, and what did you glean from I, these jobs? The, the biggest lesson that I walked away from, and, and also in between processing death claims and doing phone calls, I was also doing stand-up to the best of my ability. But what I learned, by the time I got to, to the parenthood, what I learned was to maximize my opportunities maximize them by diversifying my create creative portfolio I heard Stacey Evans Morgan say that once you know diversify your 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 creative portfolio so I I determined that you know what not only can I write comedy I can also write drama I can also write books I can also do stand-up I can also write jokes for other comics you know it's like all these skill sets and so then I started creating this brand, you know, T. Faye Griffin, words by, that's when Words by Faye was born, it's, you know, became Words by T. Faye eventually. But I became this entity that if you needed something written, funny, humorous, inspirational, whatever, you need a speech, you need a press release. I've been writing, I've been writing Sher- Sherry Shepard's bios for almost 15 years. I read every time she needs an update of her bio or a rewritten bio, I she hires me to write her bio. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so I just started cuz I never want never wanted to be on welfare again. And I never wanted to lose um, my hold in this industry, if that makes sense. Yes, I wanted to be a player, but if I'm not staffed, I still got something going on that was at least loosely in the business in the business related to what I do. So something you just said, which reminds me, um, a lot of who you are is using what's in your hand. Mm-hmm. I mean, going back to Oasis days, you took what was in your hand, which was your writing, and you, you were of service at the church. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it reminds me of the scripture that says, if you're about my business, I'll be about your business. Yes. So you were planting seed in the church, and because you were planting seed, you connected with Sonia. Then um, you started to learn, okay, uh, what's in my hand is writing. And writing can take many forms. It can go from jokes to books to scripts to um, press releases mm-hmm. to bios. It can. It, it's writing. Writing is writing is writing mm-hmm. is writing. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that's important um, for the person that's watching this to know because sometimes we... We'll pigeonhole ourselves. Yes. And you don't even have to pigeonhole yourself. Hollywood will, will do it right. for you. So you don't need to help them. You don't need to help <laughs> them. I always say writers write. People say, well, well T.F.A., what do you write? I go, writing. I write what's I, words. That's why I became Words by T.F.A. The only thing that I don't write are technical instruction booklets and grant proposals. I did one grant proposal. I hated, hated it. But if it's words, 
if I don't know how to write it, I'm going to figure out. I'm self-taught. That's the other thing. I don't have a college degree. I barely got out of high school. Left high school at 17. My mother signed me for me to go to the Army. I went to the Army. I was a cook in the Army. So I'm a self-taught writer. You can learn. You can teach yourself how to do just about anything. Well, something else. You're self-taught, but you also have lived. And writing, I believe, mm. most writers need to live. Absolutely. Just like artists. Uh, any, any artist, there's more depth. You know, it being a filmmaker or editor or, or um, a camera person or whatever. If you've lived, your perspective is going to be so much deeper than someone who taught themselves by reading mm -hmm. something or watching a YouTube video and now they're doing it. It, it also has to have some life to it. Absolutely. And, that, and you know, something that, that I love, I, I keep evoking his name because he was so instrumental in, in my career starting, which is Keenan and Ivory Wayans. And Keenan, a couple of times, kicked all the writers out of the office for the day. He says, I want you to get out of this office. I want you to go sit in the park, go to the mall, go to the movie, go live some life today. Because you cannot write from a vacuum, from a void. And so what you're saying is absolutely, you have to have a well of experiences and thoughts and philosophies to write from. And you cannot get that from just reading something or going to a conference or a webinar or whatever. You, those help, you know. Yes. Um, and I do continue to, 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 to grow and to learn from other writers and so forth and so on. Kenan's also a lifelong student. Mm -hmm. Like if you talk to him about stand-up, or comedy, he knows every, uh, what do you call it, every act of a comic, mm -hmm. he knows all the comedy movies, he really has done his homework and continues to do his homework, yeah. and yeah. I think that's, it's that's also part of it. It kind of matches up with my life, for life, for, I can't pronounce it. Philosophy. Thank you, that. I have one, I just can't pronounce it. And my life philosophy is simply this, do today, today, do tomorrow when it gets here. And as we know, tomorrow never arrives. And what I mean by that is we have to stay in the moment. We can't go off, you know, so much stress and anxiety is caused by, especially in this industry, by projecting about next season or what's gonna happen next week or whatever. If you stay in the moment and then gain an appreciation for everything that's happened, the fact that this, this, her, this pink blazer you have on is wearing me out. It's so beautiful. <laughs> but it's taking the time to just appreciate the sim. I call it the magic of yes. the ordinary day. Yes. Out of it, there are stories and stories and stories. Aesop, Hans Christian Andersen, these, these, these you know, uh, famous writers, they wrote from a wealth of of observation. Esau paid attention to an ant one day and then he wrote this story. He paid attention to a tortoise and a, and, a, and, a, and a hare and wrote a story that we're still telling hundreds and hundreds of years later simply by staying in the moment and observing life and taking it in and experiencing it. And I'm a great, I, was, I, I believe that writer, you write here first. Television especially does such a disservice to creativity because everything's so formulaic. We know that we got 26, 26 minutes and we need so many jokes per page and you know, these characters do, and it's just, you just kind of, it's like template writing. It's like, let's fill in the template. We know this character's gonna do this, da, da, da. But beyond that, there's this whole world that you right. can create. Right. And, and I, I wanna go back to the template writing because mm -hmm. yes, you have a template, but it's the great writers that make it something else. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. sometimes people think, oh, it's what's, it doesn't take that much to do it, but you still need craft, you still need life, you still need to be funny or be able to see it from a, an angle to that we haven't seen. To the extent that Hollywood will allow you to. You know, that's why we have so many reboots. It's because nobody wants to go push beyond well, what Well, we also is. have reboots because they don't want to pay. That's another part. That's a whole other yeah, part of it. So yeah, do what like, we know works that's right. because we know we can afford that and we don't have to we don't. Well, we own it. We own the scripts. Right, we're, we're just, just going to hash it That's out. Right. So yeah. you can't get created by. Yeah. You can't get written by because it's already been written. All right. you're doing is... Um, doing the screenplay by. You're, you're just kind of cleaning it up. Getting back to writing. Mm -hmm. you, because you were writing plays and sketches. Yes. You then branched out and, and wrote a full-length play, mm -hmm. which you produced mm -hmm. yourself with Melody Cochran. Mm -hmm. Johnny's daughter. Yes. And um, my bestie. 
What was that experience for you? Well, it wasn't my first full length. My first oh. full length was for the Oasis Theater Company, and it was directed by Penny Johnson Gerald. It was okay. called The Christmas Club. But this was the first full length outside of the confines of the church. And it was lightning in a bottle. People often ask me, are you ever going to put Swoop Night up again? This, the play was my indictment on the state of black stand-up comedy, which I felt and still feel has gone to a place where we are just putting the mics into the hands of anybody who's got five minutes and they stole three minutes of that. And, and, and calling them comedians and Comic View and the Def Jam culture kind of fed into that, but that's a whole other thing. The hardest part of it was raising the money because it was a full-on production. We ran for seven weeks. We did five, five performances. I had two casts, an A and B cast. So it was a huge undertaking, but it was such a beautiful experience because the people I got to work with, the actors, Nika King, Steve Olson, Billy Brown, on and on and on, Alan uh, Charnoff, all that, Carrie Eman. Now that, now that I'm naming names, I have to name everybody's name. It was just an amazing experience, a lot of hard work. But I sat in that empty theater the night we wrapped and after everybody, and I, I sat there probably two hours by myself and just cried like a baby. I couldn't believe. We got great re reviews. Everybody loved us except LA Weekly. They hate everybody. Doesn't matter. You did it. Where is LA Weekly today? <laughs> I'm just saying. So Melody and her team, she had um, two partners that came along and financed it. So I didn't have to go out and find mm. advertisers or anything. They just underwrote it. They were my angels. Well, what was your favorite thing of doing that piece? There's so many wonderful moments, but I think it was the first time, Lydia, that the first time that it was okay. Go ahead, girl. It was mine. You didn't have to share with anybody. After years of writing for, you know, putting words in, I put words in Bill Clinton's mouth. I put words in Nelson Mandela's mouth. I put words in people's mouths and wrote the stories that they wanted me to write into that. This was mine. And it was my point of view, it was my opinion, and whether you agreed with it or not, I didn't care because it was mine. If you don't agree, then get up and get out. But I got to say what I wanted to say about a topic that meant and means a lot to me. You not only are a prolific writer, but you also are a visual artist. Mm -hmm. and, and the last few years, I have seen you just blossom yeah. as a visual artist. What made you want to get into drawing and coloring? And I, I had the pleasure and the privilege, the honor last year to spend 30 days in Nigeria, in Lagos, Nigeria, teaching film and the biz, uh, producing in the business of film at the Del York Creative Academy there. I'd never been to Africa. I never had a desire to go to Africa because I went to Jamaica once and they wouldn't let me out. <laughs> They lost my passport. They wouldn't let me out. I'm like, I'm going no place where it's just mainly black people because they keep trying to keep me. But I went to Africa and um, something happened. I came home and I heard the Holy Spirit say colors, colors, colors. So I picked up, I had some watercolor pencils and I saw a picture of somebody I know online. Now I've never picked up, I've never really done anything. And I drew a portrait and I drew another portrait, and so I have all these men, I call, I call the collection now, it's a collection now. I call it the men of the diaspora because there was something about the faces of black men that in that moment captured my heart. And so then it just started to grow. I, I think the only way I can explain it is that when I came home from Nigeria, I left a part of me there, thus like I came out of the wigs and the weaves and I locked my hair and pulled my locked hair out and uh, I left a part of myself there but I found a part of myself that I didn't know existed I found for lack of a better term I found my roots I, I don't know mm -hmm. what country my people are from in Africa I have no idea but to walk around a country for 30 days and see that everybody looks like you that there's a dignity that people are walking with their heads up. Some of the most hospitable people I've ever met, I met there in Nigeria. And I did not have to code switch for 30 days. 
for 30 days. What is code switching? We know how we do. You know, you we get in a mixed, mixed crowd of people, and then all of a sudden we become a little bit more of this <laughs> because we don't want to scare the white people. <laughs> don't scare. Oh, let me pull this back because we don't want to scare the white people. You know? Edit that out. <laughs> but I think we, but I think, but I think we were taught that to survive. Yes, yes. absolutely. It's, yes. A, it's absolutely yes. a survival yes, yes, skill. Yes. I live, especially if you're in Hollywood. Oh you my want God! Want to be able yes. to get a job, so you don't want people to think, "Oh my God, I can't hire her." She would. What be we don't want them to think, she's ghetto. Yes, you know, and I'm not ghetto, even though I was raised in what yes. they consider the ghetto. Um, my mother used to say, "We don't live in the street; we live in the house on the street." So you will not be speaking this way. You will not be doing this. You know, eh, so I was raised a little different anyway. But, yeah, it's something, like you said, it's a survival skill. It's something that we're, we've been doing it so long we're not even conscious. Mm -hmm. And now they have a term for it. It's code switching. It used to be Oreo, you know. Yeah. And so now we have a new term. For yes. It. Not only is he a writer, but he's a director. He's a producer. He's also known in the business as a showrunner. Please help me welcome the incredible, wonderful, talented, exceptional writer, Danny Kalis. So your first job in Hollywood was what? The first script I ever sold was uh, To the Love Boat. And how did you get that job? My father was standing in a bank line and uh, he knew this guy in front of him. They started talking. It turned out he was a producer of The Love Boat. He says, my, my son's writing. He's got this, uh, this uh, taxi script he wrote as a spec. So he read it, and he called up and he said, yeah, I have him come in and pitch to my story editors. They were uh, two guys, they were great guys, uh, and I pitched 20 different story ideas to them. They finally bought the 21st one when I was driving <laughs> home. I came up with an act break, and uh, they said, have we ever done that one? I don't think we've ever done it. Yeah, we might be able to make a story out of that act break. Oh, my goodness. And how did you go from Love Boat to Taxi? What happened was I, I had been uh, working at a place called the Great American Food and Beverage Company in Santa Monica. On Santa Monica. Monica. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I, was yeah. A, I was a singing bartender. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I wrote about the place. Uh, it was the very first uh, original I ever wrote. Uh, and it was a sitcom. And at the time, my favorite show was Taxi. So it seemed ripe. It was about a bunch of people who were not really waiters and bartenders mm -hmm. like Taxi, but they would all come out to, uh, to make it big, and none of them had. So I wrote it. And then, again, my dad, you're going to see a pattern here, uh, knew this guy, uh, Dave Davis, who um, was one of the uh, producers of Taxi and uh, creators of the show. I sent him my great American pilot, and he liked it, and we just started talking on the phone. He says, you got to write a spec script for a show on the air. Since Taxi was my favorite show, and the show... I, anyway, I took an idea for my show, and I wrote it for Taxi, and he really liked it. And he had retired from Taxi the year before, so we sent it up the line mm -hmm. to a producer he had left behind. And I got a call from Ed Weinberger, who was running the show with, with Jim Brooks at the time. And he said, we have a show like this, but good job. So then I went and I wrote another spec one and submitted that one, and that one they bought. Wow, and how old were you then? Oh, God, that far back, Yes. Huh? Uh, I was, oh my God, <laughs> I want to say I was 27. Oh, wow, excellent. When I sold that. Excellent. Yeah. So then you got to work on Taxi for a while. Well, I was a okay. freelancer. Okay. So I wrote, the, the second one I wrote, they bought. And then based on that, I became a hot young writer. Oh, okay. Because I like to say I started my career at the, the top, top. Right. And it's been <laughs> downhill ever since. Not true, but okay. It still is just one of the best shows ever. You know, it got me an agent. It got me um, interviewed over at Norman Lear's company, Wow. Uh, Tandem. They had two new shows, Square Pegs, and Beats had written. She was off mm -hmm. at Saturday Night Live. Right. And then they had another show called Silver Spoons. My friend uh, Leonard Lightfoot was on it. Oh, I, I love Leonard yeah. Lightfoot. Oh. <laughs> we worked on uh, the Jeffersons together. He went from the Jeffersons to Silver Spoons. Of course. Yeah, of course. he played the police officer. Yeah. I was the gang leader. That he tried to arrest, yeah. Oh, perfect. <laughs> oh, I'd, I'd cast both of you in a heartbeat. 
Yeah. Oh, Leonard was great. He, yeah. He came in and saved us. He, we needed a, a... Well, so you know Silver Spoons, which is the show I worked on for five years. I did every episode except for the pilot. Earned my supervising producer stripes. So now tell us, what is a supervising producer? We're all writers. Okay. It's all writers. In television, writers are king. Not in movies. Right. But in TV, we're kings. And the reason is because... In a movie, when you write a script, and the script's done, they can take the writer behind the woodshed and beat him into an inch <laughs> of his life. And if they need something, you know, they'll get another writer to punch right, it up, but right. it's done. Right. They don't need you anymore after no, you've written it. No, done. Right. But in TV, at least it used to be, we had 22 episodes a year, sometimes more, which meant, oh my God, we need another script. We shouldn't have killed that writer. TV is where, for writers, at least for me, you know, I got to see my work every week, and it was great. Unlike a film where the director is king. Yes. The writer is king, and the director normally is a freelancer. Some, yeah, unless, the they're, unless they happen to have uh, been a part of creating the show, the way Jim Burroughs was a part of Cheers, for mm -hmm. example. Yeah, they are mostly for hire. Okay. Usually, again, back earlier in the sitcom era, we had house directors, mostly one director that worked the show, so they were pretty well ensconced. Yeah, that was uh, that's where TV needed you need a script every week, and that's why uh, writers would move up the ladder. So you start as a freelancer, uh, then after you freelance, you might get put on staff, and you'd be called. When I first got on staff, they didn't even have a title. We didn't even get credit. The guild finally fought for it, and we got something called program consultant. So once we got that, then the next thing is you would be bumped up to, to a story editor. Now that's called an Article 14 writer. Okay. What that means is you're not just a writer, but you're working in a capacity above being a writer. You're editing other people's work. You're pitching stories. You're doing more. Then you get to being a producer. Same thing, Article 14 writer. So you're still functioning as a writer, but you're doing all these other producing functions. And is that different from the showrunner? All it is is now <laughs> after the producer, you then get bumped to something they call supervising producer because okay. they needed an additional title <laughs> before you could become an executive producer. Oh, okay. Who is the showrunner? Who is usually the showrunner. Okay. So you got on Silver Spoons. You were king there for five years. No, I was never the king. Oh, you were never the king. Never the king there. <laughs> No, 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 never. Were you never. the prince? I wasn't even a prince. Oh, okay. I was, I was an earl. Okay. You okay. Know. <laughs> uh, now, I moved my way up to supervising producer, worked for some really great people, and then a couple of not so great, uh, which you have to go through in this business. Became eventually, you know, the number two person on Silver Spoons. After that, I was still employed at, at Tandem, and they'd have me on other shows. I did a show called The Charmings, which was a delight. Yes, I remember that, and, on ABC. Oh, it was terrific. Rob and Prue, Rob uh, Stern and Prude and Frazier, they were the creators, exec producers of that show, and uh, we had a grand time. From there, uh, when that show folded, I was sent over to work on Who's the Boss. Okay. And it was on Who's the Boss over the course of four years that I went from just being a producer to being an executive producer and Who's the Boss was the first show I ever ran. Wow. And then from there you went to uh, Smart Guy or did you No, do after... after Hanging uh, with Mr. Cooper. Yeah, after Who's the Boss, I ended up going over to do ha Hanging with Mr. Cooper, mm -hmm. which I ended up... With Mark Curry. With Mark lead, Curry, yeah. yeah. And I did that for show for a year. Then after that, I went back to um, work with Jim Brooks on a show called Phenom which lasted about a year, and uh, it was a great show, just didn't make it past that year, uh, and it was a chance to go back and work with Jim after working with him on, on Taxi. He was the big guy at that time. Yes, he, he, he what, was. What was something that you learned from him as a writer, as a, maybe as a producer? What, what, what did you take away that you still use today? From basically all the people who, who were formative. Um, my uncle, Stan Kalis, who was one of the great producers of television uh, through the golden age of TV, from the Dick Powell anthology series to uh, Mission Impossible, Hawaii Five-O, Police Story, the whole, I mean, what I learned from him and the writers that would work with him is, uh, and from Dave Davis, and then from Jim Brooks, 
uh, they all had one version of the thing that, that Dave and Jim both said to me, uh, which is, uh, you know, stories are hard, scripts are easy. And that is in no way to denigrate the significance of writing the actual teleplay or screenplay. In fact, once you've got your story, then the hardest thing to do is the screenplay and the teleplay. But it's about story. You've got a good story, um, it's everything. What makes a good story? Uh, well, let's start with there should be a beginning, middle, and end. <laughs> you know, Why? no matter how short, no Why? matter how long. Why? Because it needs to move you, and if it doesn't move you, then what's the point? Okay. And, you know, it's action, it's active. You know, you need an active premise in a story. You know, we were talking about uh, West Side Story and Romeo and Juliet, you know. Arguably, uh, the, the, the active premise there is true love conquers all, even in death. Mm -hmm. You know, that's an active premise. It suggests a beginning, middle, and end to your story. No matter what form or format, whether it's a, a commercial, whether it's a, a TV show, a movie, a, the, you know, a book, these elements need to be there. Uh, and they all stem from your character and whatever journey or conflict that they were uh, uh, sent down. Uh, I, I, when I worked for my uncle many years ago as an intern, which means you don't get paid, and I got to hang out with these amazing writers, one of them, a fellow named Eric Berkovici, and they'd all gather together like at the, 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 the lunch table like it was the Algonquin, you know? The, the Algonquin was an incredible hotel in New York. Yes. Where, was it uh, uh, Parker? Um, uh, Dorothy Parker, Dorothy Parker Hemingway, Fitzgerald. Yeah. Would, would hang out at, yes. He gathered around, he, he told the story of this young exec at a studio who... Uh, um, who very much, you know, wanted to, to, to make a big score with his first movie. So he, he, he locked himself in his screening room. He had uh, them run all the, the great movies, you know, Academy Award winning movies. And he emerged and he gathered his writers together and he said, I have found the secret to all great movies. Okay, what is it? And he goes, conflict! <laughs> So, uh, yeah, that's, that's what you need. Always. Always. In writing and in acting. Mm -hmm. You gotta know what you're playing, and you gotta know why you're, you're there, absolutely. I mean, a lot of times when I'm talking with writers, I'll, uh, they'll write a scene or they'll write some dialogue, and I'll just say, what am I supposed to tell the actor they want in this scene? Because I don't see it. There is a magic, an alchemy, that simply occurs in our, in our business which is that moment where you get a great story, a great script, and then you cast it. And it is in that casting where the magic happens. Uh, it just, it is, it's, it's something you just gotta know or feel. Um, it's why I hate casting. Really? Oh, well, if it's my work especially. Because I'm listening to all of these actors come in, most of them really good, and my work sucks. It's not funny, it's depressing, and I go, okay, they're gonna find out I don't know what I'm doing, and then that one actor walks in, and it's funny, and it's entertaining, and I'm going, oh my God, I'm a genius. That's the collaboration, isn't it? It's completely the magic of, of the right actor and just channeling the role. As you were breaking down the different um, job descriptions of a writer on a sitcom, you mentioned the story editor. So, in, as the story editor, do you edit the writing? What is the function of a story editor? Well, again, the simplest way to think about it is everybody's a writer in TV. Mm -hmm. for the most part. There are non-writing producers, but everybody is a writer. Uh, we are all doing story editing at any given moment. Oh, okay. It's really just a way of, of creating a chain of command. Okay. It's that So simple. it has nothing to do with the actual editing well, of the script. There is a distinction, usually. Um, everything's been blended or, or, or you know, uh, it's less defined. But usually when you are a story editor, you're working on other people's scripts, you're helping with the development of it, you're doing rewrites. Um, 
but you're not doing editing and you're not doing casting. Okay. When you become a producer, then you tend to get into produce uh, okay. the, those other functions. And how did you get into directing as a writer? How did how did it was late in the career? Uh, I was working with. Jim Brooks on Phenom at the time. He was doing his movies, so he would just come for run-throughs and give me notes on some of the uh, edits, some of the reading. Uh, after watching me work on the floor and then seeing what I did in, in the edit room with the shows, he said, you should try your hand at uh, directing. I said, okay. So I gave myself the last assignment of the year and directed that episode. Wish I'd given myself an easier episode, but uh, it was the last one, and it went pretty well. And I was utterly dependent on uh, my crew. I think it made me a better showrunner, made me a better writer, because for the first time, I'm sitting down there on a set, and I'm getting pages from my writers' room. I'm looking at, them going, "What the hell do they want me to do now?" The actors are confused. The crew is going, "How are we going to do this or that?" And it, it just it was it was it was a uh, it was it was a great experience. Would you suggest that all writers um, direct a piece just to get the feel of what what it entails to put their words up on its feet? Yeah, it's a, if you can get if you can do it, great. But you don't have to. Not required. It's okay. a whole. Uh, it's just not. It's a whole other thing. Yeah, you know, when um, I tend to think visually, uh, write that way. Um, so. Uh, it was it was sort of natural for me. Uh, others, you know, they the writers are are not oriented in that okay. fashion. Other writers are much more uh, dialogue or story. You know, it just it's it really is where you're, where it takes you. The thing about this business is is that, yes, you need one person in charge, one person who, you know, you can oversee everything and can be blamed. <laughs> But you require an incredible amount of collaboration to make it work. It's like building a house. Mm. As a writer and then producing, what do you love about producing? Because doesn't it take you away from writing? Yes, that's what I love about it. Oh. <laughs> so you're the showrunner. Yeah. And then you just check on people to make sure they're writing? Is that is If that I'm that doing works? my job, yes. Okay. I love producing because it... It, it, it allows me to stretch all the muscles. It allows me you know, to, to um, uh, not just come up with the idea, but develop the script, but then to cast it. Uh, when I drew, when I, when I, when I did Sweet Life, uh, the art director comes up and he says, basically, what do you want the set to look like? I often tell writers, you know, think like directors. You know, I mean, it drives me nuts when you're, you, you write something and they're sitting on the couch and the next thing is he takes a tomato juice out of the refrigerator. Well, how the hell is the director going to get him over to the refrigerator? You know, think in terms of entrances and exits. Where's the point of attack on the scene? You know, where are you coming in? You know, uh, all of these things you get to initially stretch when you're writing the script. But then when you get to sit down like with the art director and say, okay, here's where my entrances and exits are, I, I drew the basic map mm -hmm. of what I wanted that lobby to, to look, look like. like. Yes. And then he brings it back. And there's nothing better. It's just such a great feeling that you can say to people, I want this, and they bring it to you. Well, that's the nice part about uh, being the exec. You get to cast it. Uh, you also then are down on the stage, you're giving notes to your director about how you want it shot. No, I don't want the camera there, I want it over here. No, don't, you know, I need a cut here for this single, make sure I've got it. And then you get to go into editing and do the editing, which is the last rewrite. Make no Very mistake. Very well put. It is the last Very rewrite. Very well put. When I was working as an intern with my uncle, uh, he went in on a Saturday to re-edit. This is when they had those movieolas. He went in to re-edit something because the star, this guy named Michael Parks, he was a, right. a James Dean wannabe. Mm -hmm. So he went, Mama, we were lying like this, and you couldn't understand anything that he was saying. Or just, you know, please, come on, talk. So my uncle went in. He, he had graduated UCLA film. He re-edited the film with the thrown over his shoulder, running the moviola, so that all the angles were changed where we needed to loop the dialogue. 
so we were on his back as much as possible. Wow. And that's when I went, oh, you can do a lot in editing. Yes, you can. And so uh, that, that's the other thing you get to do. And that is the joy of being an exec producer. Uh, when I did Sweet Life, we had a uh, little, what, a Jaden Smith, uh, Will Smith's kid mm -hmm. on the show. He had, just, uh, he had just done this movie with his dad, and I was getting dressed one morning, and he was being the interviewed. The Pursuit of Happiness. Yeah, and he was being interviewed on, on, on Good Morning America, and they said, did you like doing the movie with your dad? And he said, yeah, yeah, I did, you know. Well, what do you want to do next? And he said, well, I'd like to be on The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. <laughs> and I went, oh. I picked up the phone. I called the agent. I said, uh, I called my producer. I said, Jaden Smith wants to be on The Sweet Life. Tell him I'll write a role for him. That's both the beauty of being a showrunner, that you can do that yes. in that moment, yes. right? And then he came and he did the show. Well, the point of the story is Will hung out on the set the entire time with his kid. And so we got a chance to talk, and he, of course, had done Fresh Prince, and now he was a big movie star. And I asked him, I said, what do you like better, Will? Movies or TV? And he said, oh, that's a tough one. He said, the thing about TV that I love is that you are like doing a high wire act. You start on a Monday with a script. You rehearse it all through the week. You make it better, you rewrite it. And you just work it until you got it right. And whether you've got it right or not, come Friday night when that audience is in there, you shoot it. And sometimes it's through the roof, and it's a great high. Other times you go, thank God we're coming back next week and we get to do it all <laughs> over again. And he said, there was nothing quite like that ride. And I would agree with that. But movies, he said, you can work it. You can really work every scene until you mm -hmm. get it right. Um, and that, that was a great joy to be able to perfect something like that. Of course, with his movies, he's got the budget to do that. Others, but it was a great point right. that that was part of the excitement right. uh, of doing TV is that you get to keep doing it over and over again. And so as the exec, I get to be a part of all of that. Um, and I get to delegate. When I started doing stand-up, there were two books that were my go-to books. The first one was Comedy Writing Secrets by Melvin Hellitzer. It is a book that I've been using since I started doing stand-up over 25 years ago, and I still use today. He just breaks down different types of jokes, how to get to the punchline. He gives you exercises. I love this book and I recommend it to everybody I know who is dabbling in stand-up comedy or wants to be a comedy writer. This is a must-have book in your library. The next book that is on my must list is the stand-up comedy book by Judy Carter. That book helps you not just with your comedy writing, but your actual comedy persona and performance. She takes you through all the steps you need in order to start your career in stand-up. How to get on stage, how to hold the mic. I love this book because it gives you uh, stand-up comedy from a comedian's point of view. It's a must-have in your library if you're going to do stand-up comedy. The other book that I suggest is Comic Insight, The Art of Stand-Up Comedy. And it's written by one of my favorite people, Franklin Ajay, who's hysterical. We love him. I've worked with him a lot. He's the best. And he does some great interviews with some of the best stand-up comics today. So I recommend you read it so that you can get some insight on what stand-up comics go through. Other books that I recommend are How to Write Funny by Scott Dickers, Step by Step to Stand-Up Comedy by Greg Deed, who is a wonderful comic and also a wonderful comedy teacher. The Comedy Bible by Judy Carter. The Comic Toolbox by John Vorhaus. The Hidden Tools of Comedy by Stephen Kaplan. How to Do Stand-Up Comedy by Daryl Littleton. How to Be Funny by Daryl Littleton. I'm not getting paid for this. It is not an advertisement. It is from the heart. 
I really love these books. For young comedians or people who want to get into comedy, what are some tips that you would give them? Study uh, comedy. Anybody that wants to get into comedy you should study it first. When and how I, would they do that? How? Go to comedy clubs. You're lucky when I first got into it, we didn't have as much YouTube stuff. So we didn't have any YouTube stuff, actually. So we had to go to comedy clubs. So you can study YouTube, Go to physically go to comedy clubs and talk to comedians, not young comics like yourself. So try to talk to older comics and let them know I'm trying to get into comedy, any advice you can give me. Some will. I'll give advice to any young comic that comes up. Some will not. They'll tell you, don't get in the business. we got enough comics. We don't need you. There's like a tester. Uh, when you're a young comic, how much you can, abuse you can take from older comics. And if you can take a lot of abuse from older comics, you can be a comic. Uh, because there's no amount of abuse you're going to get from an older comic that an audience is not going to give you. So you have to make sure that your, your skin is thick. Uh, record all your shows as a uh, young comic or somebody just starting in comedy. Record it all and be very honest with yourself. When you hear a laugh, that is a good joke. you got to laugh. You didn't hear a laugh, well, try that same joke two more more audiences because maybe they didn't get it maybe the timing was wrong maybe that joke belongs somewhere else in your set I've had jokes that I thought were opening line jokes and nothing I try them later on three quarters in they're killers because the audience is now they've had a chance to know who you are and, and what they can you. accept yeah. from you and what they're comfortable with sometimes you kind of introduce yourself too early to them or you expose your warts too early and they, I don't even know you yet. You know, once they've got to know you, you can pretty much say anything you want. Be very judgmental. Be very critical of yourself as a young comic. Write down your goals in comedy. And I wish somebody had told us to do this. Because going into comedy right now, you probably have a goal, an overall goal. You have a general goal. Do you want to be a cruise ship comic? Do you want to travel? Uh, do you want to be on television? Do you want to do movies? Do you want to be a comedy actor or actress? An actress is garbage. And you should, all actresses are actors. And you should also also have goals for each set. Yes, you have to have short-term goals, which are the immediate set that night. Have a goal for that week. How many shows do you want to do that week? Uh, how many new jokes do you want to write for that week? How many new jokes do you want to perfect? How many jokes uh, that you've been working on do you want, finally want to put closure to? What do you want to do this month? How many shows do you want to do this year? How many paid shows? Because there's a difference. You have to go to the gym. You have to work out. Some people call it open mics. I call it where you can drop in somewhere and do some time and work out a new joke. But then when you're getting paid to do stand-up, don't do new jokes unless you're 100% confident in that joke. But you're getting paid to be at the performance level of whoever is hired you. Be at that level that they hired you for. Don't go up there experimenting and horsing around. Because not only is that their money, which they'll make more, it's your reputation, which you can't make another. Once your reputation is shot that I hired this guy and he came up, he had a pad, he's, he's doing new jokes. I never hired a guy. What unprofessional? Once they use the word unprofessional, then your goose is pretty much cooked. Watch Richard Pryor. Watch Robin Williams. Watch whoever you think is really great. And don't be intimidated by that. Say to yourself, if you have the confidence in yourself to even be a comedian, then you have the confidence confidence to be a successful one. Who wants to be a failure? So look at somebody who's really good. And remember this, as a comedian, it is joke to joke to joke, moment to moment to moment. Don't worry if somebody says, hey, I need you to do 10 minutes. It's minute to minute to minute. Think about it like sports for those of you who play football out there. It's not a game of 100 yards. It's a game of yard to yard, sometimes inches. Write new jokes. Uh, try to write a joke a day. And this is what I advise too. Write, only write what you know. And then what you know expand upon that by reading something new every day it could just be one article that you just pull up on your phone it could be something you want to know about or something that's just right there in the news pull up something that's a new fact every single day and try to write a joke behind it because at the end of the year you got 365 new jokes or attempts and if only half of them were any good you got a hundred and you're the mathematician here you got 180 some odd jokes that should be semi-valid and in a year's worth of work that ain't bad there are some great podcasts of comics talking about how they write their jokes how they break it down what they do what they learned and that that's something that anybody can listen to or watch or not to overly push the webinar but not to under push it either i do tell you how to write solid jokes in it where you don't have the fat 
where you get to the point because a lot so of you comics do give them craft. Yes, you do. You do it, break down craft. It of is a just joke. not about making money, which is the end result of what every right. performer wants. But you have to have that craftsmanship and that foundation. And so within and the time the setup, frame, the punchline. You gotta have the setup and the punchline. Right. You can't get up there and just Start say riffing. Uh, some profanity, uh, you know, that MF, blah, 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 and that's not the funny, and I think that sometimes they watch really great comics who craft stuff, and because they say a curse word, they that's what they the zoom in on. Paul Mooney said if you're a joke, and he would know, if your joke has to end in a curse word, you don't have a joke. Curse words are supposed to be the spice. They're not supposed to be the meal. They're the icing. They're not the cake. So, if I'm in a place where people are drinking liquor, I probably will curse. If I'm in a place where they're drinking smoothies, I probably won't. Because it's the mindset of the audience. It's like playing for old people versus younger people. You know, I can do a Cardi B joke all day long in front of young people. Old people, they don't get it. <laughs> I did, I did it. I was in Cocoa Beach, Florida. I told a Cardi B joke, and they all stared at me. And I said, well, my daughter wrote that joke for me, and I don't get it myself. And then <laughs> they laughed. And that's another thing as a young comic. Do not be afraid to ad lib. Now, this is a rule of thumb, and I hope you, you follow this. Get a solid five- or ten-minute act that you can take anywhere. Solid. And from that, build another five, build another five, build another five. Before you know it, you got 30 or 45 minutes. But within, once you get that solid act, be able and don't be afraid to jump off track and say something else that has nothing to do with that. Like if somebody comes in the back of the room and they're wearing a funny suit, don't be afraid to say it. Don't be afraid to live in the moment. To call the elephant out in the room. Right. Because other people are tripping it if, if the mic goes, if the sound goes off in the microphone. Don't be afraid to put the microphone down and say something like, where'd you get this radio shack, you know, crap, or whatever you want to say. Don't be afraid to do it because you're exercising that ad lib thing, and it goes back to what I said earlier. Nobody knows your act. They don't know if that was part of your act or not. Yeah. If you didn't get to say what you wanted to say in that moment, but you came up with something funny after, write it down because there will be a next time. There was always going to be a next time. To There's use, always, it always for you repeats. to use that opportunity. Keep a piece of paper and a pen, or at very least, your cell phone to record. And the reason I say paper and pen is because cell phone can run out of the battery, you can be out of the signal area, any weird thing can happen with electronics or technology. You got a pencil or a pen and a piece of paper, you'll be able to write down whatever you want to, yeah. and it's there. And I'm a believer to do index cards. Okay. Put your, put your jokes on index cards. That's a good point. Because then you can shift around if you're, you know. Build your set like yes. that. Yes. Yes, because then one. you you know if you if you go in if you go in the smoothie room and then your next set is in the bar, right. and you need you know you can't do the same jokes. You have Those you can cars. swap them out. What I love is Joan Rivers used to catalog her jokes in cards. I didn't, I, I didn't cards. know that either until wow. later. I I I saw her uh, documentary and she had like wall to wall card uh files and she would pull it and I, this is this was this joke and this what i was like i am so impressed yeah carlin does that too seinfeld does that there are comics who write down everything they can tell you the set they did in 1999 march 12th and all of that and they are shocked by comics who do not obsessively write like that um, I'm kind of in the middle I, I write down a whole lot of jokes and I've got bags and boxes of jokes that I haven't got to and, I, and I've been trying to like you know get to them and all that but then you get so consumed with the set that you're doing and that's another thing as a young comic if you can do this you will amaze me as much as Don D.C. Curry I asked Don D.C. Curry because I, I was telling him well man I've done about 6,000 6, shows and he said, I've done 8,922 shows. He knew the exact number. And I said, how do you know that? He said, well, I started keeping track when I first started, but part of that 2,952 are shows that I did um, as podcasts, but I did monologues on each one, and the other 6,950. So he knew he, the he breakdown. Track. And he said, after tonight, it will be, because we were at one of his podcasts, and he said, after tonight, it will be blah, 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 blah. As a young comic, 
this is your sport. If you can keep stats of basketball players and you know how fast a track person can run and all that, keep your own stats. Yes. I, I've had comics that have told me, have said to me, it's like, well, man, I, li I, like, I like comedy, man, but I don't like the game. I said, but you're a sports fanatic. How can you not like your own game? Sitting next to me is a man who I like to call the comedy godfather of the Latino community. He is an actor, a writer, director, comedian, and producer. I am so ecstatic to introduce to you Mr. Danny Mora. Part of my job at the Comedy Store was to be a gatekeeper. I'd arrive at the store at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, people would start lining up. You have no idea. It, it, it was like overnight. It'd go from 10 to 15 people to 150 people waiting to get in. So I stood on top of the planter in front of the steps to the comedy store. Mm -hmm. And I give a speech about, you know, this is not an audition. This is a chance for you to get on stage and do a few minutes of material. No one's going to watch you. No one's going to offer you a job. Please, if you're an impressionist, let me know before I sign you up. It's not fair to the room that we hear Ed Sullivan three times in a row. And don't do Richard Pryor's material and tell me it's your material or you're doing an impression of Richard Pryor. It's Richard's material. So I give this speech, which was written about in Playboy magazine, because I wore a military jacket and beret. They labeled me the D.I. of comedy in Playboy magazine. I, 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 I never looked at the pictures. I just read some of the articles, but I heard about that. But I would stand out there, and these people would ask me questions. Well, how did I do? I go, well, you didn't do well. I mean, how, <laughs> how did you feel like? Well, it was really scared. Well, that's what we saw. We saw a scared guy or a scared woman or a scared fish. I saw some weird stuff on the amateur night. And God bless Mitzi, she actually patented the phrase or copyrighted the phrase or owned the phrase potluck night and refused to call it open mic or amateur night. But running the room for her, you know, she said, well, if you see somebody you like, tell me. Eventually that led to the Westwood Comedy Store where I saw a guy from San Francisco named Robin Williams. Did not rip the room apart. Nobody said, oh my gosh, he's a comedy genius. I just asked him if he could come back. He came up with Gilchrist um, and a Filipino comic and then a guy who's a legend in uh, social work for young people, another comic. I can't remember all the names for a second. Um, but he couldn't not come back. So I gave him my home number. I thought he was from Australia. He called me Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore, do you remember me? I went, yes, Robin. It's Danny Mora, not Mr. Mora. So he came back. Missy saw him upon my request, because that was my job, to see right. if there's anybody you'd like. I got to see a lot of first timers because I was there early, in the early 70s. And, and so when she saw him, she literally said, gee, he's kind of cute. Tell him to call Monday for times. She didn't say he was a great comic. Gee, he's kind of cute. As you know, he got better than cute. Um, he got to, through the stars, to the stratosphere. So people asking me questions, not have time to answer them. Robert Aguayo, my partner in crime, the prettiest Mexican in show business, that was his handle. He was a stand-up, had a musical background, and good-looking dude. So he thought, with all due respect to Vicky Carr, please welcome the prettiest Mexican <laughs> in show business, which was funny. <laughs> Vicky Carr was a huge star in, in music. But the MCs would give the, this next guy is Mexican and he thinks he's good-looking. Boom. Well, I had gotten in trouble, my first ever network showcase, I had a fight with a member of the audience, and it ended up, Charlie Fleischer was out of his mind, and he'd left a prop on the stage, an orange. So I threw the orange at the heckler, and was asked to leave the store. Argus Hamilton, Ollie Joe Prater, and Harris Pete dragged the guy out of the room, kicking and screaming, and I'm barking like a chihuahua, and stay out! And I got kicked out of the room for a few months. When I came back, Robert Aguayo was there. We became partners. And between the two of us, because we were doing the same job, rather than answer them one at a time, we just took over Sunday afternoons at the comedy store when there's nobody there. 
and people would come in. There was a dollar charge for the workshop. Say, man, uh, I, I ain't got a whole dollar right now, man. <laughs> Can you get me in and, 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 and you know, yeah, come on in. So 18 people in the room, we got $12.38. We'd go to Ben Frank's and have hamburgers, that would be it. So what, what did you do in that workshop at that time? What were you giving them? We just lied. When I meet people who want to do stand-up, I tell them it's painful. I tell them the truth, you know. And it's like, God makes you funny, not me. If you're funny already, we can help you develop an act. We can help you form structure, you know, because there's structure to this. People don't know how, how specific comedy structure is. I mean, a joke, you know, premise set up punchline, callbacks. I mean, there's so many things you have to learn, and most people learn it through experience. Right. So what we provided them was a time-saving opportunity to cut to, well, you need to do this, you said that 10 times, blah, 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 blah. But mostly what I did was motivate people, not teach them comedy. There's, it's not on the Harvard, it's not on the Yale right. curriculum. So we would just say, I, I just, honestly, I just gave people permission, you know, and sometimes that's all you need. You need somebody to say, yeah, you could do it. Well, what, uh, what just came to me as you were talking about the workshop is back then there were no books for Correct. stand up. Correct. There were no other classes. This is before take. Judy Carter. Right. She, she actually was the first she one. She wrote to, the absolute best handbook on stand up. Yes, but, but to be able to at that time, want to get up and do stand-up. There was no and, avenue of learning, mm -hmm. you know. You, there, was no, there was no University of Comedy. And because I'd been to state-of-the-art actors workshop, I learned from Peggy that when you were doing scene night, it wasn't about you. It was about her. So she had 23 actors out there, and she says, you know, that's too fat. That's too thin. That's too loud. That's not loud enough. I don't know what the hell you're doing. So in the curve of a night, in the arc of a night, there's that word, arc. You'll hear it a thousand times. What does that mean? It's not Noah's Ark. It's an arc. It's a beginning, a middle, and an end. In the curve of that night, in the arc of that night, if you were listening to the notes she gave other actors, you grew. So the idea of putting 18 strangers together who well, I had one dream or nightmare of doing stand-up, not so much their work, but the work of their peers. They could learn from everybody else's Right, and, and you, just, you just hit upon a, a very important point that sometimes actors lose, um, it goes over their head, and that is when you are in an acting class, even when you are not on doing your scene, you are getting valuable information. If you're paying attention, it will help you in your process. Let's go back to that sentence. If you're paying for a workshop, then get every ounce that you can. I don't know anybody who teaches acting in this town for free. And if they do run. <laughs> you know, we, I could name some, some legendary names, you know, um, in the acting world. But I get their students a lot. And there's this relationship some of these really Hall of Fame acting coaches have. And that is, hey, dude, if you're in my acting class, then I coach you for my fees. And I used to post the fees up in my workshop. I remember. And I'd say, that's what she gets paid. That's what he gets paid. That's what we're doing. One-on-one -on -one work. Now, I can give you a card if you like. You know, you can go study with them. And they go, really? I go, yeah, and, and see that 50 right there? You know what that means? 50 minutes, because when you work with her, there are only 50 minutes in an hour. I don't know where you went to school. Just but, like a therapist. But there's, yeah, exactly, there's 60 Just minutes in an like hour. Just like a therapist. So if you're paying for, to, to, to get acting workshops or a writing workshop, if you're paying a dime, you better be paying attention. Because there's a lot more to learn from other people's writing, from other people's stand up, from other people's films. I mean, across the board, it's, it's a learning experience. It's not just me, 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 me. It's us, us, because I'll say it today, I'll say it yesterday, I'll say it tomorrow. It's not about skill or talent in this town. It's about relationship. That's why 
when I left the comedy store, I started my own workshop called The Peer Group Workshop. Because it wasn't about me, it wasn't about you, it was about us. And that communion of sharing ideas and learning to take criticism without being offended or hurt. That's the root of stand-up comedy. What is the importance of taking criticism? To change what you're doing that isn't working and find a solution to your problem. One night Richard Pryor was on stage at the Comedy Store uh, doing an album. That N-word is crazy. And uh, there was that N-word in a lot of stuff he did. Um, but I saw Richard brought, uh, record three albums. And that'd be over a two-week period. Wally Hyder was the re recording uh, entity. And they'd put trucks up. And, and, and Richard's name was never on the marquee. But the word would get out. Richard's going to be on stage. And man, some big red hats and some Cadillacs would show up. Some little white girls, some Asian people. I mean, they came from all over town to see Richard. Stars and wannabes. And one night at the comedy store next to the entrance was, it used to be a bar. It was a cashier, and there was a bar around it, but there was a space behind that bar, like, like a dugout. And comics would hide back there and watch for free, watch the show. Some people like Shirley Hemphill and George Miller would sleep there, because they had nowhere else to go before they were made it. But one night, Richard was on stage. Nine, 10, 11 minutes. Just silence. And some young comic says, oh my God, Richard's bombing. I go, no, you idiot. He's writing something you don't know how to do. Watch him. Watch him work. Come back Wednesday. We saw him take Mudbone, the character, from 40 minutes to four. Mm -hmm. Because trial and error, trial and error, trial and error. What works, what doesn't. To see what works, what doesn't work. That's what criticism is for you. Because that silence was the audience criticizing Richard going, we don't get it. Not that you're not funny. We don't get it. You have to say something we get. It's not, and now there's a whole generation of comics who talk to the audience and then get feedback from the audience and then have combat with the audience. I don't understand that. I learned it's a communion. It's about us. It's a common experience. Jay Leno, for example, taught us. We. Did you ever notice, got, you know, they're trying to fool us. He, he's inclusive. He never said me. I had this experience. I saw this at the mall. Did you ever see a guy who did this? Did you ever notice how that? He, he was inclusive. And once you learned that, that was a tool in your toolbox. And you then, then you went on to the next level and the next level. Gary Shandling, for example, was a writer when he came to the store. Never did stand-up. Very, very intimidated, very weak. I used to sneak him on stage. Get him out of here. He's a writer. He's not a comic. I used to sneak Meryl Markle and David Letterman and a blind comic named Alex Valdez. Tell him to wear glasses. Mitzi, he can't see. I know, but it bothers me. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I used to cheat because I had this gatekeeper, you know, relationship with the club. I used to put people on the stage, give them an opportunity for... You can't buy stage time. Right. So criticism is 50% of what you need to get on stage. You need an audience. And if they don't laugh, that's criticism. Once I got in tune with my story and how important that is to the stand-up, to be true and honest to your story, as I suggested when we were talking about Peggy, one of the things I learned from her is the only legitimate thing that I own coming into that workshop world, and that is, I don't want to hear about your real life truth. Your story, your, your truth uh, means nothing to me. If you're gonna be a writer, exaggerate, lie to me, okay? Uh, just because it was a Buick that ran you off the road, there's no reason why it couldn't be, you know, a Hyundai going 150 miles with all these black guys and Rodney King in the backseat, a bus, you know, drove you off the cliff. Your truth, by comparison, everybody has one. Honesty is great. That, that stimulates, that's a good premise to start. But you gotta write, you gotta invent. Lie to me, I say. So I always say, never let the truth, 
your truth be an anchor. Let it be a springboard. Let that lead you to another story and not be trapped by, well, this is the way it happened, man. It really happened this way. Well, you know, who cares? You were talking earlier, and I want to come back to it, about the writing process and one of the things that you talked about embellishing and one of the other things that having worked with you writing um, the one person show that you told me all the time is we got to kill this baby and I and I remember that process being so painful like but I love this scene yeah we're killing babies today it's really simple it's really simple okay um, I didn't invent this I mean, I t I'll take credit for never let the truth be an anchor and let it be a springboard. I mean, that came out of my experience. Um, but the other thing I noticed, being at the comedy store with the greats of all time, in I mean, the greats, okay? I mean, I never saw Lenny Bruce on stage, but I saw the Rodney Dangerfields, the, the David Brenners. I saw Jackie Mason. I mean, I saw a plethora of old school, current, new school. I mean, I, I wealth of comedians. I had a front row seat. And what I used to recognize in them, they all had patterns and rhythms that were unique to themselves. And I kept thinking, is that something you learn? Because you, if you don't know what a callback is, you will. If you don't know what a running gag is, you will. If you don't know what a pun is, what a word joke is, you know, how to do a callback from your first opening bit to your closing bit, how to get all those story points and put them in the last eight minutes and watch them jump up and down because they're familiar with the material. That structure. Well, I'm watching these people and I'm watching how Richard co comes up with these things. I'm thinking, I just guessed that your brain does not think in incomplete thoughts. Okay? It doesn't go, Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb, lamb and stop. You do the whole rhyme in your head, but it's in your head. And your job as a writer is to take that vision, that motivation, that feeling, that DNA, whatever it is. So I learned from the writers at the Writers Guild because I was part of the, I was a founding member in the Latinos writer, Writers Committee at the Guild. We went 18 years without a success. Okay, between Chico and the man and George Lopez. Nothing, not because we couldn't write, because the industry didn't recognize us as a marketplace. No, it's everywhere, which is great. I'll die happier. But one of the things you learn is, that I thought was, part of your task as a writer is write it down. Back in the day, comics used to walk around with tape recorders. Steve Allen was the first I ever saw do it. He, he, he talked to the tape recorder more than he talked to people. And then he had his secretary, Mary, type it all up, and he had cases and reams and files of any subject, octopus, porpoise, shoes. I mean, he'd just go to his shelf because he would document all these ideas. Most comics are lazy. You know, they think of something in the car with another comic, it's brilliant. They don't know what, an hour later, they don't know, what did I, what did I say? <laughs> so I just intuitively decided that you don't think in any complete thoughts. Your job is to mind those thoughts. So what I learned at the Writers Guild was what they called the vomit draft. Get it out. Get your, sit there at your laptop, your computer, your hand, whatever, however you want to express yourself. Tape recorder, just get it out. Then go back. But don't start, stop, start. They were in a green truck. No, it's a red truck. And no, it was too many. Uh, just get it out. Because that idea is going to end up in the cosmos pretty right. soon. And be flexible in the rewrite process. So in order to get to the point where you're killing your babies, you got to give birth to all them babies. You got to go through the whole thing and then put it away and come back to it. The one thing you're really going to be surprised at if you're writing something, if you get it out, put it away, and then come back to it, you're going to go, wow, I wrote this? This is kind of nice. Wait a minute. So I tell writers, sometimes you have to write three scenes that you'll never use to get past them. You know, get it out of you. Yeah. Got to get it yeah, out of you. Yeah. And then that's where you learn how to edit. And that's what Killing Babies is really all about. Mm -hmm. How to get rid of stuff, how to cut stuff, how to make it tighter, how to give it rhythm, how to give it mo you know, momentum, thrust. That's what they used to say at the USC Film School. How do you get from one 
act to the other. Some kind of thrust that you have in your storyline. 